did it in the States. Um, they did eye and ear testing at school, uh, in part because, you know, the lack of access to health care meant that, you know, kids who didn't have health insurance wouldn't get things like eye and ear testing on a regular basis. So they did it at school, and I got sent home from school with a note saying, your kid can't see a damn thing. Perhaps you would like to do something about that. My mother was like, I don't understand this. I told you I can't see the blackboard. <clears throat> Does that say something I can't see? All right, you've been given the. The all clear. Excellent. Yeah, don't get your hopes up. I'm only ever gonna look so cute, and then that's it. Like, there's no real. All right. Uh, I'm Esper Bergman. I'm a writer and storyteller and an activist and performer. And uh, I, I used to have a business card that said uh, writer, activist, instigator, and gender jammer. I have since retired those in favor of a different version because um, it helps me keep track of what phase of my career people know me through by which of my business cards they have. Um, but Gender Jammer is still a, a title that I'm very fond of. Um, I also refer to myself in my professional bio as uh, a good example of what happens when you over-educate a contrarian. Um, I have been a variously LGBT and Q activist, um, different ones of those at different times since 1990 uh, when I was 16 years old. Well, my history with GSAs is pretty tangled up with the history of GSAs. Um, I was one of the founders of the first ever Gay-Straight Alliance, um, which wasn't even called a Gay-Straight Alliance originally. It was called something a little different. And then after the first six months, um, the very long name we had chosen for ourselves which I believe was Concord Academy's Students in Support of Gay and Lesbian Issues. Yeah, which it was difficult to pronounce that acronym. Um, was rebranded, if you will, as the Gay Straight Alliance. And it was us at Concord Academy and one of our, our history teacher, Kevin Jennings, who eventually went on to be the executive director of, the founder and then the executive director of GLSEN, uh, Gay Lesbian, Straight Educators Network, um, and now I think works for the U.S. Department of Education, um, and Phillips Academy, which was the sort of nearby private school, they also had a Gay Straight Alliance and uh, an adult advisor for it who was their lesbian PE teacher, as you have. Um, so the two groups really kind of formed pretty simultaneously, and our adult advisor and their adult advisor were in close contact with each other. Um, you know, and at the time it was a very, um, it was a very radical situation. Almost no high schools had any kind of gay anything. <coughs> um, there was a, a project, and I'm from the US, so all of this activism sort of happened in the States. Um, at the time, out in California, a woman named Virginia Uribe was doing a project called Project 10. Um, and it was an in-school school that was only for out LGBTQ kids who were being harassed so much that they couldn't do school. Um, so she had sort of a little like separate you know, one little pink one-room schoolhouse, if you will, um, which was a day program for out students. And then in New York, through the Hetrick Martin Institute, Harvey Milk School was also um, 
a few years old at that point, and it was a similar program. It was a school that existed for out students who couldn't go to school because they faced too much harassment in their home institution. What was different about Gay Straight Alliances was that A, they were kind of integrated into the larger school, and B, they weren't just for out students. You know, and at the time, this is now 22 years ago, we were pretty much saying gay or gay and lesbian. You know, and I have very clear memories of enormous argument about whether we could, when it was time for the 1993 March on Washington, add bisexual, whether it could be the gay, lesbian, and bisexual march uh, for rights and the various fallout that happened around that, including lesbians boycotting pride marches because of the inclusion of bisexuals, and it was that time, right? Um, so in the moment in which it was happening, gay straight, our gay straight alliances were very, were very radical. Uh, it didn't feel radical when I was in it because I was 16 years old and like many 16 year olds, I sort of assumed that the thing that I wanted to happen was obviously per perfectly reasonable and you know, everyone older than me should just get with the program. In retrospect, I am able to see that, you know, it was a whole new thing and I simultaneously was lobbying for, in Massachusetts, what's now called the Safe Schools Project, but which was then the, it was eventually created as the Massachusetts Governor's Commission for Gay and Lesbian Youth Services, um, on which I served as a commissioner and spoke at the bill signing and a variety of other, like they sort of trotted me out as the token kid. There are um, really regrettable photographs of me standing behind the governor with my, you know, unregenerated 1980s hairstyle, sort of the spitting cobra situation on my head. It was kind of like this in the front, sort of like this on the side, yeah. Um, but, you know, I sort of, I did those things and I went to other high schools and I talked about being an out kid in high school. My school was extremely supportive. It was also a small, private, arts-oriented high school. Um, there were, I was not the first out student. I was not the only out student. We had out faculty. Um, so I kind of did, we kind of didn't understand what we were doing, but it began to ripple, right? So we had a gay straight alliance and Phillips had a gay straight alliance. And then Kevin Jennings, who was our teacher, had a lover who was a teacher in one of the public schools in a really sort of left-leaning area of Massachusetts. And so he and one of his out students started a gay straight alliance in their public school and then a couple of others sort of started to pop up. And you know, now it's 22 years later and there are gay straight alliances all over the place on the one hand, and on the other hand, we're still fucking fighting about whether we can start a gay straight alliance. So I feel both delighted and pissed that this is still a conversation, you know, that we have to have. Because on the one hand, it feels, I mean, this is more than half my life now. We have been having conversations about gay straight alliances. Surely, I mean, and there is a, a research, you know, up to my armpits that having a gay straight alliance in a school is good for, not just that it's good for the gay students, but that it's actually legitimately, provably good for everyone. So why we're still having this argument is totally beyond me. But you know, sort of at the same time, I was involved in ACT UP, and I was involved in Queer Nation, I was chaining myself to buildings at Harvard Medical School, because I was under 18 and therefore they wouldn't arrest me because I was under 18. You know, and I was this prep school kid, right? It was one of my first experiences of using privilege to say fuck you to authority. Because there I was, white, uh, you know, in my L.L. Bean duck boots, you know, and my tidy, whatever, I guess, jeans or chinos, and my, you know, uh, 
Harvard Medical School has blood on its hands, handmade t-shirt with, you know, red, bloody handprints all over it, um, shackling myself to the, to the buildings. And this was in um, protest that they wouldn't release. I mean, and this is now so long ago, these drugs don't even, nobody's even heard of them anymore. DDI and DDC were some um, early retrovirals just after AZT came out and people thought uh, they might have a better chance of providing similar immune support with fewer side effects because AZT, as uh, I think some people now don't even know or remember, you know, it's made some people sicker than they had been and that was a big problem. And at Harvard Medical School, they were doing a lot of trials and they had a lot of HIV positive people who were participating with, you know, equal parts, I think, hope and desperation, right, in these um, medical trials. And then there came to arise the sense that the doctors at Harvard were learning a lot and were synthesizing something, but would not then reward the people who had participated, sometimes to their detriment, because some of them were people who had gone off AZT, which at that time was a very difficult thing to choose to do, because AZT was the only retroviral available, and going off it and on it was known to be very hard on one's viral load. So we had guys who were positive, who were going off AZT, to participate in this DDI and DDC study, and then rumors started to filter out of Harvard that it was good stuff, right? That it was helping the people who were getting it. And so then there was this huge upswelling to, well, fine, if it's good, if people are being helped, release it. We need it, you know, we need it now. And the people, especially the people who are in the study, you know, stop the study give it to everybody, you know, this is an urgent thing. We, we don't have time to be fucking around. And so that, you know, was a three or four months worth of, of really intense sort of local uh, political and community action that was happening right around the same time as the safe school stuff and the governor's commission stuff. So I'd take the train into Boston from my, you know, groovy suburban private arts oriented high school for the day, you know, leaving in my uh, Land's End button down shirt. You know, I'd go to the state house, testify, take it off, put on my leather jacket with the, you know, gay girls make me wet neon sticker right behind on the back of it. You know, put on my blood stained t-shirt, go on over to downtown crossing and, you know, die in the street with all of my compatriots because, you know, it was sort of all there was to do. Uh, so the two things felt very tangled up to me. And also for me, I think, created this, um, I often feel like I am older than many of the people who are actually my age because I've been out for so long and because I was so uh, politically active and active with act up and queer nation at such a young age. You know, at 37, very few of the people who are my chronological age are, remember these things, right? Like they don't, almost nobody who's 37 has, you know, chained themselves to anything in a blood stained t-shirt for the release of, you know, an early retroviral drug, right? or participated in some of these other kind of really early conversations about GSAs or queers in schools uh, and things like that. Um, and part of it for me was that I had, you know, partly from working on the safe school stuff and also partly from my queer nation work and also partly from, I was online very early, very early on America Online um, and met you know, actual grown-up gays on America Online, um, who, you know, because we're all just typing to each other in the little screen, in the window on the screen, <clears throat> were, I think, much more forthcoming with me about their lives than 
they would have felt comfortable being in person. Um, and they also felt really urgent about what was happening in terms of HIV and AIDS and in terms of queer politics. Um, so it, it created a very strange place for me coming out where I was, you know, in some ways this sort of classic, the classic youth poster child, you know, white, slightly downtrodden, but not too well-spoken, you know. Um, and then on the flip side, I was spending most of my leisure time with gay leather bathhouse boys and drag queens, um, which, you know, people sometimes say actually explains a great deal about how I turned out, right? But I, uh, you know, to some degree I was raised by, you know, gay leather bears and barely domesticated drag queens. Um, and that experience, and I also feel like I am the last of the people who had that experience, you know, in both in terms of my age queer and in terms of my chronological age. You know, one of the things that happened about GSAs that we never expected, that we didn't even, I mean, we weren't even thinking. It's not like, you know, there were strategic planning initiatives, what's our 10 year goal? We really just wanted to have a club. Like my most urgent requirement was that we get to carry the school banner in the Boston Pride Parade. And I had a huge fight. I mean, <clears throat> I'm actually in retrospect a little surprised that he permitted it, but with the headmaster of our school um, about whether we could carry the banner in the parade. And to the point that we were, I mean, really arguing. Uh, and that year we weren't allowed, and then by the end of the next year I had worn him down and we were allowed. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I had sort of grown up gay mentors, right? Um, who talked to me about politics and the arts and relationships and sex and gave me books to read and gave me condoms and took me to, you know, Glad Day Bookstore and took me to, you know, the, I mean, at the time there was no sort of good vibrations, come as you are, a clean, well-lighted lighted place for dildos. It was all, you know, sleazy, dark, sticky floors, you know, but my first sex toys, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're all, like, all of those things happened with, with older gay men who were prepared to sort of, who understood that it was their turn, right? to you know, take a couple of young queers under their wing and, and help make the thing go. It's actually not true that good vibrations didn't exist yet, it did. The San Francisco store must have existed, which I know because I'm almost positive that I mail ordered myself something from there in my last year of high school and had it sent to my door. Uh, I think that I saw an ad in the back of one of the gay porn mags that I saw at Glad Day for uh, Good Vibrations, and I, I must have written away for a free catalog, or, you know, I mean, like, written, you know, on paper and enclosed a self-addressed stamped envelope, which you, you know, sent in the mail, a thing that <clears throat> it's practically unheard of at this point. Um, but, you know, all of that was available to me in live, slightly greasy, um, person, which, you know, one of my, one of my second thoughts about the whole Gay Straight Alliance movement, as much as I think there are a lot of ways in which it's so great, you know, and I think that I think it's saved so many lives, and that I think it's been incredibly good for the kind of general combating of homophobia, is that, you know, young queers are such a peer-based system now. They don't, many of them don't seek out older mentors because they feel like they don't need them. I mean, they have, you know, Will and Grace on reruns, and I don't really watch television anymore, so I don't know who the modern gays on broadcast television are, but I know there are some. <clears throat> They're out there, you know, and everything in the world is available on the internet, so they can, you know, talk to gay teenagers from all over the place, and 
read gay porn and uh, I guess watch gay porn. I might be the only one left who reads gay porn, but okay. So there's a few of us left who read gay porn. Um, but, you know, regardless, I don't think the teenagers are reading their gay porn. They're watching it, which is, you know, that's fine. Um, but they're not, so there's no reason for them to find older folks who can actually talk to them a little bit about what happens once you're not in high school anymore, you know, or once you're not at university anymore. Um, and I, I feel like there was a lot of urgency around it particularly when I was coming out around the transmission of information because there was so much urgency around the transmission of disease, right? So we were all being very careful to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about not only sex and sexuality and sexually transmitted infections and HIV and that whole situation, but also, you know, inevitably in all of these conversations, other stuff came up, right? You know, copies of Tort Song Trilogy were passed around and, you know, all sorts of books and magazines and movies uh, were getting screened and shared and, um, you know, queer icons were sort of deified and discussed and all that, all that business. Um, I just, my husband is the, on the equity and inclusion team in Halton. Um, and just on Friday ran a big conference for their GSAs, right? They now have GSAs in every high school and a dozen or 16 of the elementary schools have them, right? So in some ways, this is super exciting. Every year at this conference, I run a workshop called Out Student Survival Guide, which is basically an unworkshop. It's so that the out students can come and have a space where they can talk about you know, what their issues are as out students. Um, and we don't let anybody else come in. And they enjoy it every year when I kick out. Whichever teacher thinks like, oh, maybe I'll just learn a few things. No, it's not your time. They're like, hee 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 hee. It's very exciting. But, you know, so this happened on Friday and in my second session, you know, there were these kids and in some ways they could have been me 22 years ago. You know, they're still experiencing a lot of homophobia in their school, and they're still, um, you know, having lots of, like, difficulty figuring out how to responsibly balance their gigantic teenage desires to be sexual with the, you know, unpleasant reality that there are one or maybe two other kids at their school that are out and at least, you know, share a sexual orientation. And you know, one of them is someone who they're you know either have already had a relationship with or are for some other reason not interested in. So you know, so there's this one kid, and he's very much like my peers were. You know, he's articulate and he's interesting and he's very tender-hearted and you know easily able to pass for five or six years older than he is and you know pretty and witty and very very gay and it burst into tears in the workshop because you know he has had three boyfriends and none of these relationships has gone very well for him you know one of them involved a sexual encounter that he feels unsure about one of them involved a you know, really intense emotional connection that the other person broke off with no particular amount of warning, you know. So he has all these kind of typical teenage love, sex, complicated things going on, but he has no way to talk about them. And he's run through every out gay kid within his appropriate age group for, you know, I don't know, his entire transportation, his entire transportation radius. Right? And he started to talk about, well, you know, we'll go into the city on the weekends, this and the other thing. And part of me is thinking, yes, go into the city on the weekends. You know, good things are in the city. There's music and books and out adults. And, queer. and the other part of me is thinking, don't go into the city on the weekend. You know, you're staying, 
your smallish town outside of the GTA or at the outer edges of it and, you know, play Dungeons and Dragons for a few more years, right? Until you're not quite so much operating entirely on the intelligence of the little head. Please. You know, and I, I finally had to take him aside and say, okay, listen. There's a lot, you know, I have very little time to talk to you, and there are a lot of things that I want to say, so I'm going to have to try and be really brief. There's two things I need you to really, 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 really try not to do, okay? Don't have unprotected sex. Doesn't matter if he says he loves you, doesn't matter if he says he's clean, doesn't matter if he says just for a minute, it doesn't matter if he says you would if you loved him, it doesn't matter if he says everybody's doing it, just don't. Just almost none of those things are ever true. Please, please try, even if you feel tempted, and oh my God, you will, please try not to have unprotected sex. And don't do meth, because you can come back from nearly anything else. But once you go down the meth hole, a few people ever get back. Just try to do those, you know, and he was, yet yeah, cry. Because he experienced that this is going to be for him to navigate just the sex, and not doing so, he's, and I have a lot of questions, right? Because how would he find all him? Because we've been to have GSAs and a hundred different about sex. It's not about sex, it's about love, it's phobia, it's about understanding those things. But P.S. Sex education, they need sex education, consent based, and just, you know, I. So, I mean, I have a degree he even protect himself or jerk or enthusiastic consent. And if there were his life who were to talk to him about things, get all his sexual education in addition to all of, all of his friendship gifts from, you know, same age, contributes to a Boros. It's unclicked himself out, but out of which it made himself. I'm trying to talk to him about how I mean, I don't teenager. What you did when you were 20 years older than you. It's 20 years older than you. About sex. And it's simultaneously, now I'm 20 years younger. I'm still than one of my, I was 17. The idea of sleeping with a 7 is frankly a little nauseating. Are young. Very young. And the lovers that I had was 42. And we were lovers for, right, we were fuck buddies. For a couple of them. But I certainly, sexual education, you know, I was standards I felt you know I was like I was being exploited you know free happening and you know about it frequently now we hear that we're constantly the idea that older people should act with each other and I sort of feel like now that I'm 40 I think the idea of sleeping with somebody who's 17 I couldn't figure out many many things sex and sexuality so if we are really evolved toward a place, we kind of collect that's not okay, 40 year olds to have 70 year olds. I basically really need to at least give them some sex education. This thing, it's not an identity, silences that. And all of the marriage equality, we're just like you, except for what we do in bed, silences that. And, you know, the ongoing conversations, which are so full of panic and fear that young people will learn about sex and sexuality, that was never, that was never what we were expecting when we, you know, started Gay Straight Alliances. We were just expecting that it would be like a little less hard to go to school. But it, I feel like it's had these reper, I mean, obviously, because I have been talking without pause for I don't even know how long, but I feel like it's had these repercussions that have radiated, that have, the repercussions that have radiated way beyond what I could have imagined. And now I know all of these queer teenagers who, except for whatever acquaintance they have with me, don't know any other queer adults. Or any queer adults in their world are like a totally separate situation that have nothing to do with them. You know, they don't like go out for coffee once a week to kind of check in and they don't, you know, take them on field trips to the sex toy store, or the opera, or the gay cinema, or Pride. You know, they don't lend them 20 bucks and 
<laughs> so they can go see their boy, girl, friend, person. They don't like, because they're afraid of being accused of something because they just, how would you encounter a queer youth these days if you were an adult, unless you were actively looking for queer youth uh, with whom to you know, get up to something or a teacher or someone in another position of authority, right? Like the teachers obviously cannot, you know, lend the kids 20 bucks and take them to the gay porn store. And you know, that is appropriate, right? But it's a weird thing because where else are they going to meet queer adults on whom they can sort of begin to think about modeling their lives? You know, when Jay and I got, my husband Jay and I got married, we invited all of his GSA students to our wedding, not the reception, just the wedding. And several dozen of them came because it was so, you know, they had no idea of gay, adulthood that involved things like a wedding where everybody's family comes, you know, all my family, all his family, everybody's friends, 150 people, like big, you know, hoo-ha and excitement. It was a huge thing for them. You know, they had no, where else are they going to see what queer adulthood looks like? You know, when I went to the creating change conference this year um, we brought our son and my parents came down to take him for a couple of days and I made sure to arrange the meetup in the conference lobby even though I knew it would be a zoo because I also knew that I was not sure where else the you know a lot of students go to this conference I wasn't sure where else these young people would see something that looked like family to them like me and my husband and our son and my parents who are, you know, have their own stuff like everybody's parents do, right? I'm sure that my kid will be saying the same thing about me in 20 more years. But, you know, who I love and who have supported me long before it was relatively popular to be supportive of your queer kid, right? Um, you know, coming to take the kid and complain that I wasn't wearing a coat and you know, argue a little bit about the arrangements for picking him back up and, you know, ch take turns chasing him around the lobby and through the revolving door, all this other stuff. Where are they gonna see that so that they can imagine themselves into that future, right? How does that become real for them? I mean, ex you know, they sort of see a version of it in movies which is white and heteronormative and skinny and, gym bodied and you know some of these other things and it very rarely involves people that you know have i think the kind of lives that they imagine for themselves you know where's it going to come from right won't somebody please think of the children I, you know and but that's the rallying cry that keeps queer adults away from queer youth because we're all terribly concerned that someone is going to think something untoward about our motives for hanging around with them. Why would an adult want to hang around with a kid? You know, where up until 20 years ago, when uh, maybe 25 years ago, I feel like nobody paid any attention to what the homos were doing. And so we were able to, you know, take care of each other a lot more unnoticed. So. It's not really clear to me how it's gonna, how this is gonna work, how it will continue. Uh, I have a lot of concerns. You know, we have, um, we refer to her as the household teenager, a 16 year old who is functionally my niece, uh, uh, who my husband uh, helped raise in a previous relationship from the time she was born until she was five. And she considers us to be her other parents. Um, and is, you know, like many queer spawn, very queerly culturally competent and was saying just today that she, when she came over to, you know, go to family gym with us at the Y and then have brunch together with another friend of ours who's a professor and then bake apple cupcakes with maple icing, she and my husband share a baking hobby and I don't really, I, I benefit.
right? But I don't really participate. Yes. Um, that her, one of her friends who has recently come out as a lesbian was saying to her, where do you think I would go to meet the teenage lesbians? You know, Morgan, our household teenager, is straight. Um, and yet, as a kid who has been raised in this very queer, enculturated space, she has so much more access to queer culture in all its forms, to queer information, queer adults, queer sexual uh, information, than you know, the queer students, or the lesbian or gay or bi or trans students in her, of her age, because it's been around her all her life, you know. Um, she's taking gender studies next semester and we've had all manner of jokes about how this is going to work out, in part because, you know, the archive that exists at our house spans, you know, in the entire history of the gender studies movement. And my husband was one of the, the team taught the pilot of this course and helped develop the curriculum for the Ontario Ministry of Education, and the guy who's teaching it is a friend of ours that she knows from having, you know, seen him at various events at our house, right? So who else, on the one hand, why would you ask a straight 16-year-old where to meet teenage lesbians? On the other hand, our personal straight 16-year-old is a better resource for her peers in terms of what queer Toronto looks like than any of the other out kids because she has the benefit of the adults in her life who are queer, who are related to her and so Therefore, we're never, you know, prohibited by any kind of ridiculous puritanical, you know, sex panic about sharing with her what was going on for them, you know. So in this way, she's kind of become the queer super user for her entire school, for her entire cohort, because she's the one that they can all turn to with these various questions and concerns, she's got the information. You know, they're all from straight families, straight households. You know, nobody in their household knows which weekend Pride is, or, you know, which 
of organization in the city has the best attended queer youth group. But, you know, our straight teenager absolutely knows that and much more besides. Okay, I, that might have been the end of that. I don't know how many minutes later that was the end of that thought. It was a long thought. A lot of ways that really resonated with me. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, potentially, like, are you suggesting other ways that we can go back to a more intergenerational model? How do we get back to it? I feel, I feel really unclear about how we might be able to turn that clock back you know, on the intergenerational model, in part because there's so much um, emphasis these days on the, you know, the fear of, you know, gay youth being taken advantage of by predatory gay adults. I, I'm not gonna say that never happened. It certainly did. It still does. You know, it seems far more common that young people are taken advantage of sexually by straight identified adults. You know, particularly judging from what we hear in the media about, you know, scout leaders and priests and hockey coaches. You know, those are not people that anyone was apparently concerned about leaving their kids with. And they are straight identified adults, or celibate, I suppose, in the case of the church, um, theoretically, who, you know, no one had any particular concern about leaving their kids with, and they really breached the community trust and, you know, hugely crossed the line and were coercive and uh, terribly inappropriate about that besides. You know, one of the things that is true for me and for the people that I knew as sort of my peer group as a queer teenager coming out, is that there was a lot less, young people's sexual interactions with people who were older, because it existed within a community of known people, had there was a lot more you know, in the same way that the eyes on the street model exists, we all knew who was off with whom and what was going on and how that was all working. You know, there was a lot more both support and accountability. That's the word I'm looking for, right? You know, you couldn't really get away with being too exploitative or too shitty. Um, in any direction without everybody knowing about it, right? Because there wasn't this shroud of silence behind which, you know, dirty things were conducted in secret. And it's the secretiveness, I fear, that causes people to get into sexual situations that they can't then figure out how to get out of because when it's, now that it's gone bad, in order to tell somebody about it and get help, they would have to tell the secret about which there would be repercussions because they don't feel safe, right? I feel really unsure about how to um, revive the intergenerational model because of that, because of everybody's sex panic. I think if it weren't for that, it would be a lot easier, you know? Um, And in all directions, you know, on the one hand, I'm trying to look out for much younger people who need really basic information. And on the other hand, I'm really aware of queer and trans seniors who, you know, are not partnered or who did not have children or both. And so are now reaching, you know, their less mobile, less social years very alone, you know, never having imagined as younger people, maybe not imagining they would live that long, maybe not really having prepared for it in some way, but now they're 75 years old with no children, no partner, or their partner has predeceased them. 
um, a social network that consists of, you know, whoever they can still be in touch with. Maybe now they're in, you know, assisted living facilities, which are not particularly queer. And, you know, so they are in some cases are having to erase large portions of their history, right? I wish there were a way that we could kind of put the ends together in some way. Well, in part because I feel as though, you know, however much I think it's unpleasant and ridiculous, we do desexualize seniors. We are not concerned that people in their 70s or 80s are going to be sexual predators. We sort of assume that they are not sexual at all. Um, but they have an enormous amount of information and perspective, which are things that, you know, the 13 to 18 year olds in need in, you know, urgently require. Um, I, I wonder if there's a way to kind of put those two groups together, giving the, the younger people more information, more help, more, you know, perspective, and the older people, you know, more companionship, more of a sense of continuity of being able to participate in something if they don't already feel like they have, you know, that available to them. And I know that there are queer and trans seniors who really don't. You know, maybe the answer is to skip the whole middle 50 years between 20 and 70 and, you know, put the teenagers together with the grandparents or the non-grandparents, the people of grandparent age. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, ideally, I would love to sort of, you know, dial the cultural sex panic back and get straight people to mind their own business and stop trying to mind mine and uh, let queers take care of queers and trans people, you know, queers and trans people take care of queers and trans people in the ways that, you know, we have been good at and get the, you know, gay men and lesbians who have not always been super good at taking care of other people in community on board with that project. You know, when I'm king, right? These are the things that will happen. Um, and, you know, take real tender um, time and care with younger folks and also, you know, respect what they have to bring to the movement and to activism. You know, as someone who was a youth activist, I'm very aware of the fact that there were things that I could do as a 16, 17, 18 year old that would be totally impossible for me to do today. You know, ways of speaking truth to power that are only available to youth in part because they are so protected in what they say, you know, legally and, and in other ways. And in part because only when you're 15, 16, 17, 18 are you ever as certain about the truth, the absolute unshaded truth of things, right? Once you get older, you start to see everybody's sign and things get nuanced and, you know, you start trying to solve the same problem that you've been trying to solve for 15 years and you're still banging your head against it and you can't have a new thought to save your life, right? Energy and certainty to the point of absolutism and new perspective are what movements rely on youth activists for, right? Uh, and, you know, those are incredibly valuable things as we, you know, try and figure out where as a kind of larger and more, you know, larger in terms of age, larger in terms of, you know, our global reach movement as we try and figure out what we're doing you know, we're going, I feel like we need to figure out how we can do it together. Um, whether or not that's possible, totally unclear to me. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm going to be collected soon, I think. Good, I'm glad. Baylor, Morgan. I think not right. A big mess. No. Oh, no. Are bad at home. Oh no. Okay. No, it's okay.
do I have a takeaway for? I mean, I, if possible, that the takeaway point is we're going to have to take care of each other, you know, and we can't continue to rely on government or policy or any of those things to do it for us, which is not to say that those initiatives are not useful, but we can't behave as though that's going to be enough, right? We have to continue to look around, not just over to the legislature, but around us where we are to figure out who needs what and what we are going to be able to do about that. You know, the whole thing about how you're somebody, you know, that is true in this case. Somebody needs to make sure that this happens. Or, you know, somebody should tell that kid that it's not a good idea to, you know what, we're all somebody. Right? And I don't even, I mean that both in the sort of let us all now empower each other and ourselves way, but I also mean it in the way of, you know, it is also your responsibility. These are also the things that need to get done by someone. And, you know, it might, could just as well be you. Perhaps it should be you um, to figure out who you can take care of. Um, is maybe the most important thing that we as queer and trans people in community can do. Uh, and as we start taking care of each other people, of other people, as we start to take care of other people, um, we are also cared for, you know. As, as much as that sounds like a sort of hippy-dippy, you know, let's all give it up to God um, way to go about it, I really feel like that's how communities exist, you know. If we pay attention, more than anything else around us we can take care of right now in this moment, um, we can then trust that someone else is also paying attention to us and paying attention to how we need to be cared for and therefore able to help us with the things that we need and you know the whole world goes around. Right? Not to be too, okay. <laughs> Good? Yeah. All right, I need to call home because we're at our house playing with Ella. Okay. That's not as bad.